Schedule Man, exploring authentic stories of personal growth and lessons learned from people living true to themselves with creativity, passion, and purpose. For all past episodes, subscribe on iTunes or visit NoSchedulemen.com. And please, connect, share, and contribute with a comment, rating, or review. And now, here's your host, the No Schedule Man, Kevin Ballmer. I've been known to struggle with reality. Not that it is any real mystery. I just don't have time. Broadcasting from London, Ontario, Canada. Welcome. I'm Kevin Ballmer. This is Journeys with the No Schedule Man. We are here to celebrate and share the journeys of heart-centered entrepreneurs who have challenged themselves to expand and grow into their potential. And as we have these conversations and share these stories, it's amazing, at least to me, how all kinds of great lessons and examples of triumphs and challenge and, uh, and how people have overcome those things and embraced new opportunities just seems to naturally come out through the course of the conversation. And this morning, today, I say this morning because we're having this conversation, at least the live conversation, on a Monday morning, but this may, you might be finding this sometime in the future in the recording. It could be at whatever time. Anyway, at this moment, today, our conversation is going to be with the guy who rocketed into my life as a speaker at the event series that I host called Mo Mondays London and actually absolutely uh, lit me up and lit the stage up with his personality and his story of, of perseverance and self-realization and overcoming adversity and um, it's an example, I feel, of how certain people come across our paths when we are doing the work that we were really meant to do and we're coming from a, a heart-centered place. It's amazing how these people just tend to appear across our path almost as if by magic that we just almost feel as if we had known um, for whatever amount of time, a long time, when in fact, the friendship has only been really sort of short-lived in terms of actual, you know, <laughs> time. I was going to say TikTok time. I don't know what the heck that is supposed to mean. Uh, but in any event, uh, I've been. It's just been a joy to connect with Shiva Duty. I'm really inspired by him. I think you will be as well. I'm going to share more about him and his story in just a second, and share him with you as we get into what is episode 106 of this podcast, Journeys with the No Schedule Man. You'll be able to find this uh, and all episodes of the podcast at noscheduleman.com or you can just go directly to noschedulemanpodcast.com. I want to remind you that you can subscribe for free if you want the audio. If you're an Apple user, go to iTunes. Do they still call it iTunes? I guess you still need iTunes or Apple Podcasts. <laughs> you can find us there. You can find us on Stitcher, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio. Just look for Journeys with the No Schedule Look for Journeys with the No Schedule Man, and you will find us there. Also, if you are looking for the uh, the video at No Schedule Man on either YouTube or Facebook, all of the uh, the episodes are are on YouTube. Up until episode about eighty three. We were audio only, so the video is not all that interesting because it's just basically a slide and then the audio playing. But since about 84 and on, we've been doing the, the audio video simulcast uh, like we have here. But you can subscribe for free. You can find all those links at noscheduleman.com. While you're on the website, jump on our free email list and get our letters from the little engine, inspirational email into your email box every couple of weeks and then we'll let you know about new episodes of the podcast and other stuff like that if we think that it's something that you need to know about thanks to those who have supported journeys with the no schedule man including diamond and gold treasures at 4330 Colonel talbot road here in london ontario you can learn more about them and connect with laura at diamondsgold.com mo mondays london i mentioned that just a moment ago how i connected with shiva it's the inspirational event series hosted by yours truly once a month here at the, uh, in London, Ontario at the London Music Club, or at least we used to do that before the lockdown hit. Perhaps at some point we might get to do one again. <laughs> For now, you can join us online at momondays.com slash London. Thanks to Ryan and the team at Mulligan Realty Group, the kind of realty you deserve. If you've got questions about real estate, if you've been thinking about buying and or selling and you're not sure how this current situation that we're in as we're recording this conversation with the coronavirus lockdown is going to affect that. Give Ryan and his team a call. They'll help you through that. 
MulliganRealtyGroup.com is where you can connect with them. Brett and his team at Provincial Glass and Mirror have been very busy because they have been helping put up some of these glass partitions that are keeping a lot of our frontline workers as safe as we can possibly make them during this very difficult time. In quote unquote normal times, they're a, a top notch professional full, full service glass company owned and operated right here in Southwestern Ontario, Canada. And they've been a great support of Journeys with the No Schedule Man. You can learn more at provincialglass.com. If you're interested in learning more about insurance or investments for Canadians and or for newcomers to Canada, I recommend you reach out to Carol Trickett. You can do that at trickettfinancial.com. When you're talking about insurance and you're talking about investments, finances, things like that, you really want to have somebody that you feel good about, that you can trust. And I completely recommend reaching out to Carol. I know that she will hold you in, um, in great stead and will take very good care of you. And keep in mind the Turtle Tribe, which is our online coaching community supporting heart-centered entrepreneurs and creative souls like you so that you can experience more of what you desire and deserve. You can learn more about what that involves and join us today, if you like, at www.theturtletribe.com. So it's episode 106 of Journeys with the No Schedule Man, and the guy that I'm introducing to you today is um, somebody that I met through Mo Mondays London, and um, it was just an absolute joy to get to know Shiva Duty. Shiva is a senior technology leader with over 14 years experience helping some of the leading financial institutions in Canada transform their business challenges to propel massive growth. He calls himself a storytelling officer, for his unique ability to use storytelling to present technology solutions that help business users appreciate and seamlessly become part of their transformation journey. Mashiva is also an award-winning speaker. He's known to entertain, engage, and empower audiences through his humor and his storytelling, and that certainly is what I experienced through Mo Mondays London. In 2018, he started his own coaching platform called Shiva for Joy, and what he's doing with that is empowering IT professionals to seamlessly transition into their next level leadership role by equipping them with the necessary skills for an enjoyable transition. Now, that's a little bit about what he does. I'm most interested in who he is. And that's a really, really, really incredible person with a great story of transformation and overcoming adversity. And maybe even more than that. Uh, an example that he can share with us of what do we do when adversity strikes, like what it has done to us all across the globe right now, how do we keep going? Now, the first thing I've got to check, Shiva, is if you can hear me okay, because I can hear you in my headphones <laughs> before telling me that you couldn't, and I decided to just keep going. Are my lips just flapping with no words coming out, or can you actually hear what I'm saying right now? Yeah, I can hear you, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> my friend, it's wonderful to see you. It's always, you know, this is one of the drawbacks of this technology stuff. There's too much. Hey, can you hear me? Can you see me? Is it working? Are we on? Okay, we're good. Uh, and thank you for the time. Just to give people an idea, when was the last time you actually had a day off? Uh, Kevin, I lost you. Oh, for crying out loud. He's not hearing me again. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you what to do. Well, he can't hear me, so. <laughs> I can hear I you know. I can hear you now, Kevin. Okay, if you lose me again, sign yeah. out and then sign back in. All right, and then I'm just going to keep the uh, I'm going to keep the broadcast going. So sometimes the wires get disconnected. Just disconnect and then come back in, and I'll keep the broadcast going. Cool. Okay. Okay. Sure. No problem. All right. I just had asked when was the last time you actually had a day off, Shiva? Yeah, actually, day off, right? Because every day is uh, uh, so new and coming. So I never take a day off. Like I will be always busy with something or the other. <laughs> Right. So, for example, today I took a day off from work and we are here chatting uh, live. Well, that's what I mean is like from the work that you're doing, especially since this lockdown hit, you haven't had a day away from it in a long time, have you? Yeah, for sure. Because the thing is, like I lead a team of 40 people and my full time job keeps me so busy. And uh, we have been scrambling across to make sure all our teams are working uh, uh, with, with remotely with all the necessary uh, access to do their work so it was so busy for the last uh, many weeks and finally I got to take, take that one day off <laughs> from work so that I can really uh, focus on the things that I really like 
uh, like helping coaching people and having a conversation with a good friend like you <laughs> i appreciate that you're very kind i was going to suggest it's uh, uh now i feel like i shouldn't have bothered you here you finally get one day away from work and then i fill up your morning with uh with the conversation but it's um um you're the kind of person shiva who i think uh helps the rest of us see our own light and our own power just by the opportunity to be around someone like you and the um, the uplifting energy that you emit, um, not by any means, I don't think of trying to manufacture it, but just by being who you are. Um, but if, I, if I'm reading it right, I think I'm hearing you say and share that you weren't always that way, were you? Like, um, if you rewind a little bit back into the past, how would you describe yourself, sort of your mindset and, and your physical body compared to how you are now? Yeah, so I would kind of, uh, like, if I, if I rewind, uh, so, like, in 2015, 16, I was kind of a guy who is, uh, who is really uh, pushing hard to succeed, who always looks to grab opportunities. And moreover, physically, I was, uh, I was not that fit. It's not that uh, I was unhealthy, but I was, uh, I was lethargic. I can't uh, even walk for a while or even take some uh, strenuous things. That's when, when I took up the CN Tower climb. That really showed me, uh, like in 2017, when I took the CN Tower climb, it really showed what my physical levels are because I struggled to go to the top of the CN Tower. It took me like 42 minutes to reach the top. Uh, so that is a, is a reminder that, okay, see, I'm just 34 then and I was really struggling badly. That, to me, begs the question then, for those especially that don't know the story, if you're really struggling badly physically, why take on something like climbing to the top of the CN Tower? Which, for, by the way, for those who are not here in Canada or are not familiar with that structure, am I correct, Shiva, that it's 144 floors? Yes, yes, oh, it is one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like just going up a three-story walk-up. What made you want to take on that challenge? Yeah, that's a very good question. So for that, I think we need to rewind for the back. In 2010, I think it's exactly 10 years from now, I, I took my first flight to Toronto. So when I was actually uh, coming to Canada for the first time, I spoke to one of my friend who is, who is back then living in Canada. I asked him, okay, I'm coming to Toronto. So he said, uh, so yeah, then that's nice. You can see Niagara Falls and you can see CN Tower. Okay, I, when he said CN Tower, that intrigued me because oh, a tower, maybe a tower, something uh, like a 20 feet, 30 feet tall, maybe that's a structure that I can see. So I did not really bother to check anything about the tower. But then when the flight was landing in Toronto, I can see that huge structure in the skyline. And I was really mesmerized by the beauty of the CN Tower. So I think it's like a, a love at first sight for that for the structure uh, and its beauty. And after that, it so happened that uh, even when my first job when I worked for Royal Bank of Canada, my office was next to the CN Tower, literally next to it. So from my window, I can always see the CN Tower. So it's like uh, the love towards it start growing. And because I was the person who came in all alone in the initial stages uh, from India, so I immigrated on a work visa so for me, there should be some emotional connection to the, to the place. So it's, the CN Tower became an emotional connection for me. It's like, it's like me, my parent, like looking after me always. So that kind of emotional bond I had for CN Tower that, uh, that built Im immediately. So when I was looking for my first place to stay, uh, then I was looking for various apartments and I got into this apartment, which is on the 16th floor. I stepped into the balcony and there it is, the CN Tower in front of me, right in front of me. So I did not even look at anything else. I just grabbed that unit and that's where it started. So I, I had that feeling for the CN Tower. I, like, I looked at the admiration because if you are living in Toronto, you know, you can see the CN Tower from any part of the city. So that's where it started. And... Uh, later on, if you really want to know where I got, got to start this climb. So in 2017, uh, so I, ha I had a bit of break from work 
and uh, there was one of my friend his name is Manish he walked up to me one day and said hey shiva there is this cn tower climb uh, challenge that i'm taking do you want to join that that's when my uh, eyes lit up and i said okay why not i'll just come and give it a shot <laughs> that's how it started tell me more if you would about how you were feeling around that time i've never been through a, a major transition like what you have of moving to a completely different part of the world and getting immersed into another city and um what was all that like for you that 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 mixed into the person that you were at that time when your friend even mentioned this this climb to you uh, so you are talking about the 2017 or when i just landed in toronto all of that oh yeah good <laughs> <laughs> really i'm asking you to boil a, a bunch of stuff down into uh uh, into a shorter time frame. I, I, I not time frame is not the word that I'm looking for, Shiva. But um, no, I just well. When did you arrive in in Toronto? When did you first move there? Yeah, that's a good question. So it was in 2010. It's like as I mentioned, it is 10 years ago. Um, so I was I took up this new job in a city in India. It's called Hyderabad, and uh, my manager asked me. Uh, so there is this. Uh, opportunity for a 45 day assignment it's a 45 days assignment in toronto i said okay why not i can get give it a try because uh, i haven't traveled outside the country maybe it is a good thing that i can explore a new place it's just only 45 days away from the family that i can just deal with it so i landed uh, in toronto on may 4th 2010 and and when I, when I came here, it was like a 45-day assignment. I came in, I just have to understand an, a payment system for, for Royal Bank of Canada. So when I started working, like my one thing that I'm really proud of is whatever I do, I put my heart into it. I'm so passionate about anything that I do. Uh, so the day I started the work, I was passionately looking at how I can improve things here, how I can actually make a difference. And in just 30 days, I did a presentation and everyone in the management really, really fell in love with what I did. And they said, what, can you stay, stay with us for three more months? I said, okay, three more months should be fine. So I stayed for three more months. And then they said, can you stay for nine more months? I said, okay, and then I have to bring my wife. <laughs> so I went back uh, in 2010, in October, I went back to India. And after a couple of weeks, I came back with my wife. And then it went on. People really started liking what I do. And the nine months became two years. And now I'm, it's been 10 years. I haven't moved from the, from the city. Though I changed multiple jobs, uh, and this, this, is, this is like a second home for me now. What was it like um, initially getting adjusted to Canada? Uh, I never had a problem as such because one thing is I've seen it's so culturally diverse and people have all the warmth and it's like I never felt it's I'm away from home. One thing because maybe the emotional connection I had instantly with the city the CN Tower. I talk a lot about CN Tower because I can't really express what kind of emotion it is. It's like it's like your parent who is actually watching you every moment, right? Uh, so if you if you feel if you feel a bit uh, low, you can just look at the skyline and there it is. The CN Tower is there. Something that you can closely relate to and is something you admire. So that way, uh, I think. It, it was it was like normal for me staying here uh, in in Toronto. I was making friends. I had like because I'm from India. I like Indian food. Like there is a lot of Indian restaurants here, and uh, there there are a lot of people from various backgrounds. I'm and I'm a, I'm a people person, so I really like making friends. I really uh, like building that network, and that's what happened after I came to Toronto. So it never felt. Uh, uh, um, new for me yes fast forward then to when your friend mentions the cn tower climb to you in 2017 what sort of physical and, and emotional shape loosely were you in at that time yes so by that time by 2017 like there was a lot of 
uh, like even though I liked the place, I was working hard. I had to change jobs. The thing is, what what I what I realized is by twenty seventeen, I came to a point wherein I was really looking to uh, to grow very rapidly. As part of that. i was really looking for opportunities grabbing things how can i actually grow fast grow quickly and there was a lot of disappointment when things don't work your way and so so emotionally i was really uh, at the at the lowest point because uh, uh, i was going through some uh, emotional disturbances in my personal life uh, my work wasn't really something that i really really enjoyed because i f- i was i was always feeling that i can i can actually uh, contribute more i was not getting those opportunities and even my public speaking was suffering a lot because even then like in 2017 i felt i was the best speaker in the world i can actually become the world champion uh, so I was, i was i was so over confident during that time that i really know everything uh, so that is the state of mind i had and physically if you, if you say like physically i was like 70 about 1 154 160 uh, pounds uh, not overweight but uh, physically not that strong i was actually sleeping for 8 to 10 hours a day or even weekends i used to sleep for 16 hours <laughs> at stretch so it was not really a healthy uh, healthy lifestyle back then you mentioned speaking really quickly um we'll come back to that <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that because I didn't realize that you were speaking at that point um already so but the speaking is definitely something that's uh near and dear to my heart because it's what brought us together yeah. but you've painted the picture and thank you for sharing so openly about um kind of where you were at that point and now you're going to take on something that that takes a lot of physical endurance yeah. <laughs> and trying to climb the CN tower so um What what happened? Let's start with how what did you even do to start to prepare for your first climb? And so th- that's pretty interesting for the first climb. Um so like I just came to know that I need to raise like $200 minimum minimum for the for the climb and uh, my friend said, "Oh, you you just start eating healthy and do some workout." Um uh, So what I did was initially first thing is first thing that came to mind is okay I have to raise some money um, so why don't I do this I used to take subway to the to work like it was uh, it was like 4 to 5 kilometers of a subway ride uh, so I started thinking okay why not I skip that subway ride and start walking so it will be like I'll be having some physical exercise and I will be saving some money that I can divert it to the fundraiser so that's what I did I started walking um and uh, saving that f- funds whatever I have so that I can contribute to the fundraiser but it so happened you know the toronto weather is so unpredictable and there were a lot of rains during that time so I hardly got any f- any physical exercise but I was uh, fortunate enough to just raise the $200 because I have some good friends in my toastmasters club in my work so raising $200 was in that a problem but i was really physically not ready for the climb when you say that you were walking instead of taking the subway <laughs> and going through the toronto weather which can be very erratic depending on the season yeah uh, what distance was that that you had to go uh, it was like 4 kilometers one way it's 4 kilometers so that's a pretty good walk yeah <laughs> <laughs> especially if it's snowing or pouring rain. Um so you know now that you you say that you weren't physically ready for the the climb. Um but you went and did it anyway. So what happened? Uh, so uh, on the day of the climb, my friend who uh, who actually signed up with me, he had to finish the climb the day before itself because he had a he had a personal uh, situation. so he finished the climb the day before itself leaving me all alone uh, for the climb uh, so i i was at the venue and n- now i put on my bimo t-shirt because i was working for bimo i'm still working for the bank of montreal so i was it was part of the bimo team so i put on the bimo t-shirt 
and now I was looking for some company so uh, whom I can actually uh, join to uh, to go all the way to the 144 floors and that's when I noticed a bunch of uh, young young women who are who had their BMO t-shirt on so initially I felt okay let me go join them maybe maybe some good company but then init- then I hesitated you I know my physical situation and if I don't make it to the top I can't even show my face to face to them <laughs> the next day at work uh, so I hesitated. I did not uh, me. I did not join anyone, and I just started climbing all by myself. So initially, I started slowly, started climbing, and the the story is in the speech. <laughs> well, I'm going to take for granted, uh, or I assume that a lot of people, maybe even most, who come across this podcast haven't heard the speech, yeah. uh, or even if they have, it's uh, it's so powerful that I, I think it's worth revisiting. Yeah. Uh, but before we just jump right into it, I wonder if you can help me and others with a bit of a visual. I've never been in the staircase or the stairwell of the CN Tower. Is that what it is? Is it is it like a winding staircase or like, how wide is it? Is it just concrete steps, like in a parking garage? What does it look like? Well, that's a good question. So I think uh, it would be more like uh, uh, you have a metal railing and the, the stairs are like you can have two people climbing together. That is the amount of width you have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's just a concrete, a concrete um, stairs. That's it. But then it's not winding. It will be like normal stairs. And you'll have t- 12 flight of s- twelve stairs for each each uh, floor. Like li- literally the floors might, might be much smaller than the normal floors. Uh, but it's like, it says 144. But each, each floor might have like 12 to 16 steps. That's what I remember vaguely. So it's... They're concrete steps. So <laughs> if you've ever run on concrete, you know, that can be very unforgiving. You're going up 12 steps and then onto the landing and then around and then up another t- 12 and then up and around, sort of like that. And it's yeah. only as hard to get two people across. Yes. Wow. It almost sounds kind of claustrophobic to me. <laughs> well, because how many people would you even guess? Like, is this dozens of people that are doing this at once? Is it hundreds of people? How many? Yeah, it will be hundreds of people. Like they keep keep walking, and the people yeah. and the ones who are walking slowly, they will be on the right side, and and the ones who are fast and who wants to actually break the record, they just keep running on the left side. Okay, that gives me a bit more of a visual. I had tried to imagine when I'd heard you do the speech about where the volunteer would be that spoke to you, and I'm getting a little ahead of us, but. Um, I even wondered where would they be? Maybe on one of the, I guess I'll call it a landing between two yes. um, sets of stairs. Um, so you, <laughs> you've already set the stage for us. You don't really feel like you're physically ready, but you, uh, you go and you take it on and you start climbing. What happened? Yeah, so I just started climbing. Uh, I felt the people who I started climbing with are, or lazy like me because they were all walking, climbing slowly. So I just joined them. I started climbing slowly. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I was living on the 16th floor back then. Um, so I, I said to myself, okay, let me climb 16 floors and then take a break. So I climbed for 16 floors and I took a break. And, th- and then I continued. I reached 22nd floor I, and I said to myself, Maybe this is the time I have to take a bit a longer break. <laughs> so at 20 seconds, I take another long break. And then I kept on going. But then I reached a point where in at 32 floors, I was on the floor, literally huffing and puffing, struggling. I can't even imagine I can even go further. This is the time when a volunteer walked up to me. He said, sir, just keep going. There is water on the top of the tower. <laughs> so then I looked at him with confused uh, like mind like there is there are 112 more floors <laughs> do you, is it not easy for me to just go back uh, but the rule says you cannot go back 
he just smiled at me and he walked away and i was there all alone i was just thinking oh man today this is my last day of my life if i go any further i will die <laughs> uh, and i was going through this i literally gave up i was on the floor for lit- maybe 2 to 3 minutes uh, i was struggling and that's when i noticed a young teenager he might be like 13 12 12 13 years old he was joyfully climbing with his dad he was just having a conversation as if he is walking in a park <laughs> that really hurt my ego badly <laughs> because look at him he's a teenager and he's joyfully climbing i'm just study for and i just i struggle even to take next step and that's when i decided today either i'm going to the top or i would just perish <laughs> uh, so my ego kicked in and i just started pushing myself and i struggled it was really really very painful because the more you climb you see You, you keep on counting every floor okay 44 45 then it's it's like it's like completely draining because you really don't know how far you can go you just uh, hang on to the railing and you just push yourself like you push your you just literally walk with your hands because your legs are no more available so i just hold to the railing push myself climb one more step climb one more step and i just kept on going and going and going and finally i this is like it's like it says 144th floor you go there and and the tricky part is once you reach that 144 floors there are six more floors for you to go to the top so at 144 floor i felt as if oh it's all done <laughs> but then that's when i realized i have to climb six more floors <laughs> I somehow made it to the top and the moment I made it to the top I immediately decided I am not going to do this again I I had to drink two bottles of water back then and then I came down that was a whole journey of going to the top when you came there I was meaning to ask you this and, and now I I can I'm assuming that they let you come back down on an elevator. Am I correct? <laughs> yes, that's true. Okay. Okay. Um and what was the the approximate time that it took you to go all the way to the top that first time? It was 41 minutes and 52 seconds. Okay. Um let's remember that time. 41 minutes and 52 seconds. That's going to become relevant here in just a bit when we continue the story which you say you had committed to yourself that you were never going to do that again. But before we move on, I'm curious why you think you felt you were so driven to complete that climb when you were in such physical discomfort to the point where you're using phrases like you thought that you might perish. It's not as if if you didn't get to the top of the tower people were going to come and take your family away or something like that. Um Why do you think Shiva looking back at it it was so important to you to keep pushing yourself on that occasion? Yeah, I think there were there were two things as I remember. One is definitely definitely the the young kid definitely challenged me and I'm a kind of person who who can who don't want to quit. So if I take a challenge I just want to push I'm very competitive like since my childhood I'm very competitive. So that was first major factor and the second one is the uh, the cause that i'm doing for the united way that i'm trying to support that was behind my mind um like when i started raising the funds i started learning about united way and the work that they do and that was so inspiring because i've been in the city for uh, for, for 10 years now and and i have seen uh, the kind of people around and the various initiatives that united way does the sec- that was the second driving factor so i felt this is a noble cause that i'm really doing for and there were friends who supported me for the fundraiser and as a result these were the two motivation motivating factors for me to go ahead push myself and i have to do this today and that was the reason i said today i will push myself reach to the top whatever it takes Before we move on there's one more part of that story that you just shared that I'd like to explore a little bit if you'll indulge me. 
and that is your observation of the teenager who you described as climbing and going along joyfully. You described it as, as if he was going for a walk through the park or something like that, but joyfully. Now, I, I can't hear or see the word joy or joyfully now without thinking of you, which is a pretty wonderful thing, I think. But I'm curious about what your, your description of, of joyfully is. When you say that you saw him climbing joyfully, what does that represent to you? Um, I, think, I think what really it represents is he is in the moment. Like his physical body is not a problem. Uh, he's not really worried whether, okay, can I go make it to the top? Like it's his mind, nor his, nor his mind, nor his body is a problem for him. He's really in the moment. He's cherishing the time that he has with his father uh, doing this climb that he's going to remember for the rest of his life. I love that description. <laughs> that just gives it a deeper meaning for me. Uh, in the moment, physical body, not a problem, and cherishing the time with his father. So you were alone, your physical body absolutely screaming at you that you might die. And um, I guess you were in the moment, whether you wanted to be or not, but you were probably wishing that you were in a moment about 100 plus floors beyond. So you get to the top of the tower, and then the next six floors, and you chug two bottles of water, you promise yourself that you're never going to do it again. <laughs> what made you decide that you were going to do it again? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the other thing that I want to add here is once you finish the climb, you come down the elevator, then there, will, there is a point wherein they'll be giving you a T-shirt with your time on it. So, <laughs> okay. so, so they gave me my T-shirt, which is 41 minutes and 52 seconds. I look around, everyone is like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So I was, I, I like, felt like I was a dumb guy. So I put on the t-shirt and immediately I put on my hoodie so that I don't show the timing. <laughs> so th that was the moment that really, like I took 41 minutes and 52 seconds. That stayed with me for a while. And, and, then, I, and then the climb finished and I went back. As I mentioned, see, this is a point wherein I was physically not fit. I was emotionally going through a lot of challenges. So I really was looking for solutions because uh, when when you go in, when you, when you're emotionally not fit, then either you blow up or you go down, right? You either go blow up, go angry, break things, shout at people, do whatever it is. And the other thing is, if you are not that aggressive person, then you go deep, sunk yourself into depression. You cry and go, to, go through that thing, right? So I was emotionally not really stable. I was physically not really good. And this is the point wherein I felt uh, I need to do some yoga or meditation. Uh, as a kid, I was doing, I used to do meditation and uh, I really know the benefits of it. But I really want to try yoga this time. And when I, when I thought of doing yoga, I really don't want to do like the hot yoga or anything like that. Because I'm from India, I know uh, the yoga started in India and it's a, I want to try the traditional yoga. So I was looking for various uh, options. And that's when my wife, uh, uh, she, she said, okay, look at, this is something called inner engineering. Maybe you need to look at it. So I browsed for inner engineering. I start, and it really sounded interesting for me because I'm a software engineer and engineering, I'm really... Uh, it really is something that I'm very close to my heart. So I said, okay, why not look for this inner engineering? So, And I immediately looked for it. I'm a kind of person when I look something, it clicks, then I immediately, immediately take action. So immediately signed up for the program and I did that program. It's called inner engineering. Uh, it's a it's it's a, back then it it was an online there was an online part to it which is seven seven online videos which you need to finish as a preparation before the program and then there is a two day program so I finished that inner engineering program and and I started practicing yoga and meditation since then because the sec there is the second aspect to it right so because I'm physically not that fit I want to do more. So I also signed up for one more program, uh, which is called Anga Mardana, that is like a physical body workout. 
So this is a yogic workout without using any uh, tools. Like you don't need any uh, physical equipment to do the yoga. But then it is so physically uh, enduring that it will strengthen your body like anything. So I was doing both of these practices uh, every day, twice a day, kind of. Uh, so I was doing it for three months. I started doing when I started doing it. Then I really felt okay. So I, f- I was feeling good about it. I was f- emotionally, I was getting better. Physically, I was getting better. Uh, so the first thing that came to my mind is the CN Tower climb. <laughs> so the moment the CN Tower climb um, started, like the registration started. I signed up for it and you know I, I'm competitive so I came up with goals for myself. The first thing is I'm turning 35 so I want to raise $3,500 for the fundraiser and the second one is I want to beat my previous time by 15 minutes. So I came I started with these two goals. Um, so, so I have this uh, first major goal to raise $3,500 so what I did is I did a speech and I did a speech about my uh, journey, the previous climb, which is hilarious and funny because of all that struggle that I went through. I did that speech and I started uh, uh, sharing that speech to my friends, people in various clubs to raise the funds. So that was my way of raising the $3,500. Right? And uh, because I'm, I'm ready for the climb, so I was doing the yoga regularly, so I was feeling better. And the day of the climb, I was really, uh, really up for it. That's a piece I didn't know that you created a speech about the first climb to raise the funds for the second climb. Where did the, the Toastmasters part of it fit in? When did that happen? Okay. So uh, when, I, when it comes to public speaking, yeah, I think you're passionate about it. I'm passionate about it. I think yeah. we need to spend some time here. Uh, so uh, it, it was in 2003. I was in, I was in my uh, graduation. Like I was in my engineering uh, degree. So there was once I attended a personal training workshop. Okay. And there was this young guy who did that workshop. And I really was so inspired by him that I felt I should be something I really want to do something like him I want to be a trainer I want to actually be a public speaker and immediately what I did is I brought this huge tape recorder and I started rehearsing my speeches Uh, there is a point wherein uh, like it was towards the end of the end of the uh, college uh, university and everyone wants to look for a job right Everyone was preparing for job interviews and everything, but I was here sitting with a huge tape recorder practicing my speeches. So that that was the kind of passion I had for public speaking uh, back then. But then when I did not land a job once I graduated from, uh, from my university, that gave me a reminder that I need to focus on getting a job first. My public speaking can wait. I struggled hard. Like it took me eight months to get my first job. <laughs> that was a huge, uh, um, huge struggle for me. So I took it took me eight months to get my first job. Once I got my first job, then I felt, uh, yeah, I have to really work hard because I felt working hard you can actually uh, grow. So I started working really hard, and my public speaking uh, went to the bam, took hit. Okay. So again, in 2016, 15, around that time, uh, that's when I started Toastmasters again. Okay. But then there is an interesting story regarding uh, joining Toastmasters as well. So uh, in 2014, 15, that is the time when I was actually working for Royal Bank of Canada. That, was, that is another financial institution that I worked for. And uh, back then... Um, because I was really work, really doing excellent work, I was made as a technical lead for a major initiative. It's like a transformation that the bank is trying to do. And they made me as a technical lead for that particular project. So as a technical lead, my role was to work with solution architects to design a solution for the future. Okay, So the solution architects that are working with me are like, they, these are like, 
highly qualified uh, uh, highly experienced uh, guys their experience was greater than my age like they were like 60 years 50 years uh, kind of guy and they back then i was like 28 29 uh, so what happened is because i was there with the system for for a while i really know what is the solution so i have this idea that i really wanted to uh, implement for the project and i started every day i used to come to the work and i used to start convincing them okay this is the solution that really will give you good results for 6 months i had to talk about the solution i had to explain it to them and for 6 months i struggled to uh, really bring my idea to light and at the end of 6 months the solution architects couldn't come up with a better solution so my director uh, said why don't we go with your solution but by that time it was too late that it there it took 6 months for us to come up with a solution so uh, i did not get any credit but this but the project really uh, was a massive success and uh, people who really uh, uh, appreciated my work they really gave me some wonderful feedback that i that that is still there on linkedin so the recommendations that i have on linkedin is for the work that i did back then but then there was this interesting thing that happened that is the very good reminder that pub, the, the importance of public speaking i had this wonderful idea that uh, i'm really sure that really is going to give massive results and it did but it took me 6 months to convince someone about about the idea right and that's when i one of my friend uh, at work he said oh i think you need to join toastmasters that's when i joined toastmasters <laughs> it turned out to be a really good skill for you and it uh, served you well at that time it sounds like in in serving you well now it's interesting to see you from my perspective so kind of laid back and quiet um because when you're on the stage you um you you seem like a, almost a completely different personality from the guy who's sitting across from you right now uh and i feel like i do that a little bit too um that when i'm i'm on the stage for whatever reason everything else just seems to go away how does it like real quickly how does it feel like for you now when you get up on the stage and do something like what you did at mo mondays london I perceive like you just came to life your body language the physicality with which you speak how animated you are but if someone is just getting uh, introduced to you for the first time now with this conversation I think they they would be shocked to see you on stage at, at how you just to me like just completely come alive how do you feel when you're doing it Yeah I th- I think uh, I think it's like really living my life right uh, being alive so, Yeah actually uh, in um, this is what really i can sum it up right so i think my yoga and yoga and meditation that i have been doing that is what actually keeps me in the moment so see uh, when when you are on the stage you are a, you are there to share yourself to the audience and if you really want to do the best neither your body nor your mind should not be a hindrance for you right you should not be conscious like how your body is feeling nor you should not have other thoughts in your mind so when your body and mind is is really working for you then you will naturally do what is required like for example the gestures i did not plan it the facial uh, movements i did not plan i did not plan anything i just want to be the person who i am and share my whole self to the audience because because that's what makes me alive and that is possible only if i i'm there i'm not my mind is not thinking of anything else my body is not giving me any problem that's when i can actually do my best so i think my success as a speaker like when i look back what i really started reinventing myself is the more i spend on um, rejuvenating myself uh, with my yoga and meditation uh, the more at ease i am like that's where i say my journey to be joyful like on the stage i i want to be joyful that's 
that is really given I, if i am joyful then whatever i do will will be of utmost will, will be the best i i can deliver you certainly were like that when you were on our stage at Mom Monday's London. I just was uh, looking it up to grab the link. I'm going to put it into the comments of our live Facebook feed now. Uh, for those who come across this episode, either audio or recorded on YouTube, if you're already on YouTube, just put in Shiva's name, uh, Shiva Duty, Mo Monday's London, and you'll find it. If you're watching uh, live, I've just put the link into the, the comments and you'll get the chance to see Shiva absolutely come to life as I've described. Let's go back into the timeline now, and um, you're getting ready for the second CN Tower climb. You've set a goal for yourself that you had the time, which was 41 minutes and 52 seconds, that you were so ashamed of that you wouldn't even show people the time on your T-shirt. <laughs> you covered it up with a hoodie. Um, you said when you had got to the top of the tower after the first climb, you were never going to do it again, but then you dug into inner engineering and the other uh, yoga work. You're starting to feel better. You decide that you're going to go back and do this. You want to raise $3,500 and you want to cut your time down by 15 minutes. Here you are at the base of the stairs again for the second climb. What happened? Yeah. So I was at the base of the climb. The moment it started, I started pushing everyone because my goal is I just want to make it to the top as soon as possible. So I, from the from the get-go, I started uh, briskly climbing up the stairs. But then, like, I started climbing physically. I was really there. So for me, it was really not giving me any problem. But but then I I, th I felt like taking small breaks will give me that uh, time to uh, rejuvenate myself, refresh myself, and continue the climb. So I was climbing, taking a break, just climbing. Like, I just went on like that. So I really did not feel any any anything at all. I did not really feel, uh, can I take another step? I was physically uh, feeling much better, like climbing stair after stair. I was just rapidly going up. But then I was taking those small breaks here and there. And when I made it to the top, I just made it in 26 minutes and 20, like 26 minutes odd. Like, I don't remember the exact number, 26 minutes and 15 seconds, yes. It's 26 minutes and 15 seconds. So that's, um, I'm no mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> Even with the breaks, you achieved your goals. Um, did you achieve the, the $3,500? Yes, I goal? did. Yeah, I did. I think that's a different story I need to talk, talk about as well. So well, we got a lot to tell here. So do this part quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so the $3,500, when I said, I started sharing it to my friends, my, uh, because as, as I mentioned, I'm also a coach. Uh, so I was actually talking to my, my students, my clients, telling them this is the goal I have. And I started pushing for it. Wherever I speak, I talk about my goal. And I made a lot of friends as part of it. And uh, everyone came behind me, like my my colleagues at work, my teammates, my vendor partners, uh, everyone was behind me. Everyone helped me with funds. And it so happened like by the time it was, it was the last day of the fundraising, I, I made it to 2,500. Like I reached 2,500. And I was really thinking, okay, maybe this is it. I made 3,500 goal. Okay, I made 2,500. I was waiting there. But then that's when you need to know about this uh, wonderful human being. His name is Eric Kurt. So he is, uh, he is one of my coaching client. And he felt so inspired by my, uh, by, um, by my initiative and my goal. So he came to me. Uh, he called me the other day and said, uh, so yes, uh, so you know, you have, I have to pay you my coaching fee. Uh, so which is like $500 then. Uh, for, for a renewal and uh, you have this fundraising of thousand thousand dollars so what if i pay you thousand dollars for your fundraiser instead of giving you your coaching fee i said that's that's amazing <laughs> right so for raising raising funds for the fundraiser is something that fulfills me so much so i said you, instead of uh, yeah you can definitely help me with the fundraiser and the last day, just before the fundraising is closing, uh, he he actually uh, helped me raise the remaining thousand dollars 
to reach my $3500 that's so amazing um and that's something that drew some questions when you were at the mo monday's london event that there were people that were amazed at how you'd been able to raise that much money which is is fantastic uh, i didn't mean to rush you into that question either I, but i do want to make sure that we've got some time without uh, taking too much of your one day off um where we've been talking for almost a full hour and we haven't got yet to the medical diagnosis that now you have and i think this is very important to share shiva because well for a number of different reasons least of which is that so many of us our friends our family members our neighbors ourselves come up against challenges that seem completely unforeseen and especially when they come at times where it seems like we're doing everything right we're, we've got a lot of forward momentum going in your case your your as you've just outlined it's it had been and still is i'm sure very important to you to give and to contribute and to help others who are helping others you were fully invested in improving your physical health your mental health your emotional health your spiritual well-being you had set some aggressive goals for yourself you achieved those goals you were bringing people into um the the community and the energy of what you were doing that's all positive but then all of a sudden you get hit with a lightning bolt of a um, of a medical diagnosis that 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 sidetracks some people permanently what's that story <laughs> yeah uh, so see uh, i did not realize that we are close to uh, one hour already <laughs> uh, it goes so, quickly doesn't it <laughs> yeah yeah for sure <laughs> it goes faster than the cn tower climb not that we're on a restriction but i would love for you to share um whatever you feel is in your heart to share about this part of the story yes and so um it it was march of uh, 2019 it was last year um i was actually preparing uh, preparing for the district toastmaster speech contest finals uh, and one day i woke up with a lump in my throat uh, so initially i ignored it and i felt i'm able to speak i don't have any problem eating uh, let me get through the contest because it was a district finals i just don't want to take any chance <laughs> uh, and even i told my wife uh, see i have this but let me finish up the contest and then i will go see the doctor i i went there i did my speech i was i was at the district finals i did the speech uh, unfortunately i did not make it to the top 3 but it was a wonderful experience altogether speaking in front of 300 to 400 people and once i finished the contest i was a bit disappointed that i did not make it to the top 3 because i i felt i won that day because I, there was nothing i could do better than that and then my wife my wife sunita she was she, she felt she was started questioning so when you are going to see the doctor i i felt okay let me go see the doctor so i booked i went to the walk in clinic the doctor saw me and immediately said Shiva, I think we need to get an ultrasound. So I went. I I got the ultrasound. I uh, he said um, there was a call I got from the clinic after a few days saying the doctor want to see me. I said okay, it's just normal. Maybe uh, he just want to go through the results. I was in the in his room. I looked at the doctor and I felt something weird. He was worried. He was really. Uh, uh, Scratch, scratching his head and seemed very worried and he looked at me and said shiva i think we are expecting the worst here um i felt what is that worst can be he said shiva i think you got cancer <laughs> so the, i couldn't even believe my ears like i heard the word cancer because i do yoga i do meditation i eat only healthy organic foods so it was like a terrible setback for me i he had it on me the medical report i couldn't even believe my eyes looking at it and i went home i don't want to talk to my wife about it because i don't want to uh, really uh, make her worried so i i started thinking what is this i started exploring uh, what i can do so that moment i really felt uh, like life has it literally brought me to my knees i really was clueless like what's happening uh, what i need to do here so for for a few weeks i kept it to myself i started thinking okay what i can do 
but then i really started preparing for myself okay so if it is a throat cancer like i have these many months or these many years left uh, if not i had to go through chemotherapy i might lose all my hair uh, so what's going to happen to my signature look <laughs> so uh, so a lot of ideas were going through my mind uh, and i was looking for various options uh, how can i actually rule it down because you know in canada we have to wait for the, our ct scanning or uh, C- for a ct scan you have to be in the waiting list so i was really waiting for my ct scan to happen um, and then uh, like and then i had to really look how i can actually get the ct scan done so my family doctor said oh, go to the emergency clinic and uh, wait there ask them this is emergency you need to get your ct scan done i got my ct scan done and even in the ct scan they still said so this is this looks like cancer and uh, i think you need to go through a biopsy so i had to sign up for the biopsy i went through the biopsy and even after the biopsy they said it still looks like cancer we need to really look it further and in the meantime my family doctor asked me to um, meet a uh, respirologist and that's when i met the specialist she looked at the report and she said so this doesn't look like a cancer but this is really a, a severe bacterial infection and you need to go through 6 months of treatment so i was actually expecting for the worst and uh, even though it is 6 months of treatment i said okay let me go with it i felt <laughs> i felt really relieved that it's not the the worst uh, and i started the treatment the treatment was really really painful because i had to take 10 pills every day and then <laughs> and uh, i was actually going through a lot of uh, emotional mental physical uh, issues with the treatment but then the yoga and meditation that the inner engineering um, but then i did not give it up i started doing my meditation regularly though i couldn't do the workout i was doing the meditation regularly every day twice a day and i literally was spending a lot of time with the, yoga and meditation and tuning my mind and started because for me the inner engineering practice that i do is my source of joy so when i do that practice in the morning i literally there are times when tears drip through my eyes like i feel so ecstatic and when when i experienced that i felt i want to be like this every day so irrespective of the physical pain that i'm going through with the medication the emotional issues that are coming out of it this was my hideout like so i felt good doing the meditation i said okay let me explore more i was trying to see what are the other meditation tools that i can use while i was not feeling well so literally every day 2 hours every day i was spending time doing my meditations and yoga and that really helped me recover because the medication is really working but then it it has its own side effects but since i was helping my body to heal by itself the recovery was started happening very quickly and in just 3 months uh, my lump is completely gone my 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 uh, i'm started feeling better i went to see my specialist and she said yeah it's surprising you're completely cured but you need to go through that 6 months of treatment because you you were on antibiotics uh, so i went, came back home i started taking those medication but then uh, this is the time for the cn tower climb again <laughs> and this time i don't want to miss it uh, even though i'm physically not ready i was going through the medication still i said this is something that i have to do and i signed up for it how many months into the treatment was that climb um I think it was after 4 uh, or 5 months because my treatment started in May and and it was the climb is in November it's like 4 or 5 months gotcha okay I'm still I'm still in the medication the medication is still there it's st- the medic like it's like this like the moment I take the pills and then my body completely uh, take be, uh, be, uh, makes me crazy like it, uh, it <laughs> it's it's like I, there are days where when 
after the medication i had to uh, go to the bed directly i have to sk- skip work so it's all about the uh, medication not the actual health problem the medication was so powerful that i had to go through all that wow um you really got a uh, and and are still going through it sounds like a um Well, your idea of, of to keep going joyfully back to the first climb when you saw that teenage boy and how he was just going joyfully and you committed that you were going to do that, you really got confronted with this, a very difficult challenge that would have given you uh, all kinds of reasons why not to keep going or, or if to keep going to not be joyful about it. And it sounds like you had some positive momentum going through the inner engineering and the habits that you had developed, um, which is fantastic. And it looks like they're carrying you forward very well. What, as we wrap up this conversation, what happened at that third climb in the midst of the, uh, uh, of the treatment for the bacterial infection? And, and just to set the stage, I'll remind people that your first climb I've been making notes. I've just got to find them. (laughs) What was it? Uh, 41 minutes and 52 seconds. And then the second climb you did in uh, 26 minutes. And now in the third climb, you had had the emotional toll taken of being told that you had cancer, an an awful thing to to go through, whether you have it or whether you don't. Uh, We could do a whole conversation just on on that, I think. Mm Um, and then the physical toll and the and the, the mental and the emotional toll of getting this treatment that's ravaging your body and trying to maintain your sense of inner peace and your own sense of, of moving forward joyfully by embracing the few things that you could control about your body through that process. And now you're ahead of schedule on the treatment, and <laughs> but you're still <laughs> not at optimum level, but you decide you're going to go 144 floors straight north again. What happened? Yeah, I think I think I need to reiterate one thing because when I told this to my wife that I want to do the climb, <laughs> she looked at me <laughs> like, "Are you an idiot?" <laughs> uh, but then I felt like this—that was something that really uh, is fulfilling for me, and uh, I want to have that experience of helping, um, being part of the community, doing something for the community. So I signed up for the climb, and the moment I signed up for the climb. Everyone from my previous fundraiser, everyone, I did not even ask for them. They were, they started helping with me with the funds. And in no time, I raised $2,500. And that was a huge uh, motivational factor that I have to go and do this climb. So the day of the climb, I was at the bottom of the CN Tower. And I started talking to myself. uh, am, Am I an idiot? Because... I literally killed myself in the first climb. And now after this treatment, I literally had gone through so much in just four or five months and I'm up there again. Um, So I was trying to think, what I can do? How can I actually uh, climb the CN Tower? And that's when I remembered the young teenager and his dad. And they told me the secret. Yeah, if you're just joyful, you can climb easily. And for me, being joyful was more natural because of the inner engineering practices and the yoga that I'm doing. So I said, yeah, let me be joyful and experience the whole thing. So I started climbing joyfully. I was in no rush. I don't want to beat any times that are of my past or anything like that. I just started slowly climbing. But then I had one other uh, goal. I will not take a single break. It means you, you talked about that landing. I don't want to even stop there. That was the goal I had. I will just keep walking, not even taking a single moment of break. So I kept on walking. I was only, think, I was only feeling the joy of helping, contributing to, my, to, the, to, the, to the community that I live in. And, uh, and all the people, all my friends, all my well-wishers who supported me with the fundraiser. I just wanted to um, make sure I stand by that. They're behind me. I now, now it's my time to contribute and do my best. So I kept walking. I kept walking. It was, it was so jo- 
I can I can even still feel the every step I took because it was so memorable for me uh, the joy that I was feeling of contribution of of the inner peace that I had I kept on climbing and in no time I made it to the top uh, and I still had the energy to just keep on going I felt oh it's just 144 floors I can do on one more 144 that was the kind of energy I had that moment I finished the climb I came down and they said I took 28 minutes and 1 second. Hmm. And did you get a t-shirt for that? Yes, I did. <laughs> and did you cover that one up? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um it's an amazing story. You're an incredible example to the rest of us. Um before we wrap up, how are you feeling now? um especially as we're we're having this conversation in the midst of the coronavirus shutdown and mm-hmm. your challenges all over the world it sounds like you're still on the 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 medication treatment and and what not but um at the time that we're we're together amidst all those circumstances and everything that you've shared with us uh how do you feel right now yeah i'm feel perfect i feel perfectly okay i finished my medication as of end of december so end of december Great. was completely off the treatment and but then one thing that i started working upon since january is uh, spending more time with uh, my yoga and uh, practices i learned few more yogic practices uh, so uh, in from january till march february uh, i was actually spending close to 3 to more than 3 hours doing yoga and meditation daily and to just sum it up all together how i'm feeling now like for me it's no different i was going i was feeling i am i'm having the same experience i'm joyful i have the same passion and enthusiasm with which i'm doing anything i i think neither the coronavirus nor the shutdown nor the workload that i had nor the all the cancelled speaking engagements nothing could really bring any frustration to me any any sadness or anything i'm still the same person i'm still joyful i am still passionate about what i do uh, so that's this is this is this is something that happened over the years from 2017 as if i felt as if uh my life or uh whatever you call the higher self the universe is actually getting me prepared for my cancer diagnosis and the treatment the sea and our climb hadn't had to happen if, if the sea and our climb had had not happened i couldn't have had this physical uh, transformation that i had without that physical transformation going through that treatment would have been a nightmare for me uh, emotionally i would have been drained uh, physically i would have been drained and i would not even be in a position to speak to you at this point of time because after going through the through the whole treatment if i had to go through again the lo- shutdown or lockdown i would have gone crazy and i can empathize with so many people around the world who are going through this because for them they're caught of guard i don't know how many of them are prepared for the whole thing because i can see the thing i i i manage a team of 40 people and i every meeting i look them and see how they are going through it because everyone uh, it's not easy i'm i'm saying it's not easy staying home uh, doing things that you don't normally do uh, there are people even in canada i think we have enough uh, spaces where in people can walk around uh, the houses are a bit big but pe- places like in india wherein you have in one house there are 10 12 people living in for them going out is not there and they are actually locked down uh, in in these circumstances i can really empathize the emotional stress they are all going through and i think i feel that the universe has given this gift to people some people like me who who has already gone through a such certain uh, certain challenges in their life and learned from it it becomes our responsibility of going through the transformation now to share that same to the people around the world be the beacon of hope that through this crisis even though these crises are still there you can still go through this joyfully because when you are joyful your mind body energy and emotion everything will work for you 
and for you going through a challenge will be just seamless because you will health is not a problem anymore your emotional health is not a problem you will just be joyful because you are living the most important thing in life is the life itself because this virus this lockdown has taught us all it's not the money that you that you earn it's not the uh, the status or or your uh, network that you build whatever it is that really doesn't matter what really matters in this in in life is life itself and how you can celebrate life is just being joyful if you're joyful you will experience life to the fullest shiva it's uh, my great pleasure to call you a friend i'm so glad that we connected um i encourage people to go back and watch your talk from uh mo monday's london a couple of months ago and i look forward to getting back on that stage and inviting you back uh to london to see what you're going to do next but um thank you for being here today and for taking some of your <laughs> the one day off that you've given yourself and you've invested part of it with with us uh we're grateful thank you so much and uh, continued good health and and enjoy to you my friend thank you so much kevin and thank you so much for this opportunity and and i i i want to thank everyone who is uh, watching live and who is going to watch this again in the future uh, i think this shall pass i think we are all in it together uh, just be joyful and keep going absolutely thank you so much that is shiva dudi uh what an incredible story and as i had mentioned his uh, the speech that he gave at mo monday's london is available uh, on YouTube at youtube.com well i think it's slash mom just look at for mom monday's london and put shiva's name into youtube <laughs> and you'll find it or if you're still with us live on facebook uh for the live broadcast you'll find the link in the comments there otherwise you will find this episode uh both in audio and video on the website at noscheduleman.com you can also go directly to noscheduleman.podcast.com if you like it's episode 106 we'll put together a blog post where you'll be able to stream and or download both the audio and the video of the conversation with Shiva if there's any part of it that you would like to revisit uh or share with some friends you'll be able to do that and also choose whatever channel that you might like to uh, listen on while you're on the website please do sign up for our free email list and get our inspirational emails called letters from the little engine they come out every couple of weeks and a reminder that you can subscribe to the podcast for free uh you can listen to the audio on iTunes Apple Podcasts Stitcher Google Play Music iHeartRadio or you can also find us at no schedule man on both YouTube and on Facebook on behalf of Shiva Dudi my name is Kevin Bulmer I want to thank you so much for joining us today uh, I hope that you please stay safe take care of yourself and as Shiva has said we will uh, we'll move through this challenge together and uh, see the other side just as soon as we hopefully can I'm certainly looking forward to that I'm guessing just as much as you are thanks again so much for joining us on journeys with the no schedule man we'll see you next time